Mr. Teru, in this video we are going to define continuity. Now you might have been introduced to continuity of functions in pre-calculus. We're going to expand on that, on that idea and give you a lot of definitions and properties that you should be getting introduced to into your calculus class. So just expand that previous knowledge if you got to the end of your pre-calculus book. If not, we're going to define it and, and uh, show you some examples that hopefully you'll get complete understanding whether you've seen this concept or not before. The continuity of a function. Now we're going to, in this video, define continuity on closed or open and closed intervals and show how the one-sided limits allow us to check for continuity on closed intervals. I'll be showing you the properties of continuity. Uh, I'll be defining the two different types of discontinuity, removable and non-removable. And then we'll finish up by doing five examples, all with different settings that hopefully will help you really completely understand this concept and, of course, complete your homework and understand it. So a function f is continuous at c if three conditions are met. And we're talking about right now continuity at a point. Now the value of c here we're talking about is an independent variable, some value that you can plug into the function. And uh, okay, again, continuity at a point. We need to make sure that the function at c, that f of c is defined, that I can even plug it in and get an answer. Um, that I'm not trying to plug C and it's like not a value where there's a hole in the graph or a vertical asymptote as, as an example. Those are uh, very common places to have discontinuities. The limit as x approaches C of f of x exists. So we have to have a real limit. Now, uh, I don't know in your textbook if you've been formally introduced to infinite limits or not, but we are talking about real limits. We're not talking about the graph going off to infinity um, at a particular value of C. And the limits of C as uh, f of f of x, or the limit as x approaches c, excuse me, of f of x is equal to f of c. Now this is all very complicated looking and there's three actual steps that we need to uh, go through to check for continuity of a function. But visually, continuity is very, very simple. It's just simply, uh, can you take your pencil and put it on your paper and draw the entire function in a smooth, continuous form? Uh, a discontinuity is anywhere you have to pick up your pencil and maybe skip or draw a hole in the function or where you have to skip a vertical asymptote, as, as an example. So if you can draw the function with, and, and never have to pick up your pencil, then we, on that interval, would define it as continuous. But this is what it looks like mathematically. Continuity on an open interval. A function is continuous on an open interval AB if it is continuous at each point in the interval. Now remember, we are using proper interval notation. This isn't like coordinate A, B. So your interval notation you started to hopefully use in pre-calculus talked about square brackets and parentheses. The parentheses are your open interval. And if you're not sure what I'm talking about, it's right over here. At least before, after I get this one last definition. Everywhere continuous is continuous on the entire number line from negative infinity to positive infinity. Think of your sine function as just a wave from negative infinity to positive infinity, or a parabola that's smooth and continuous and extends in, in both ways to, uh, forever, or a line which is um, you know, not vertical. Examples of discontinuity, again, at a point, discontinuities at C. Well, the function could be undefined. Now, there's three ways for, well, I, I've drawn three ways. I, I've actually kind of only drawn two, really. Um, where the function is undefined. Maybe there is a hole in the graph where um, holes, at least in the pre-calculus level, and there may be more difficult uh, settings later on, but um, our experience so far with finding holes is with rational functions where if you have a fraction or a rational function and there's a factor in the numerator and denominator that can cancel out and sort of simplify that function, well, that factor that can be factored out if one exists well, you would still have to account for the value that made that original function undefined, and there you get a hole. Uh, vertical asymptotes um, are kind of, can also come from uh, rational functions where the denominator is undefined, but it doesn't cancel out. So these are examples of the function being undefined, and thus I would have to pick my pencil up to draw these graphs. I couldn't do it in one smooth motion. And so it's, discontin it's discontinuous at C. The limit as x approaches C of f of x does not exist. Don't forget, again, we are talking for real, and actually it's true for infinite limits as well. You must be approaching the same value from both sides. So <clears throat> this graph doesn't, uh, or this function doesn't exist at C, but there is a limit at C. It's uh, 
whatever that basically that y value is. Maybe it's approaching four from both the left and the right. And it's just getting up to like the three point nine 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 nine. If you remember finding your limits uh, numerically and graphically. Well, here you're approaching a different y value from the left and the right. So the left and right hand limits, uh, while they exist for this function, are not equal. So the overall limit does not. And then finally, well, I said in my uh, example here, I wrote that these were equal, but actually I need to show that they're not equal. Um, you know, a function can have a limit and be defined somewhere else. Um, so here our function has got a left and right limit. They're equal, and maybe it's approaching a y value of 3. But there's, there's, there's another portion of the function that says, well, at f of c, this function is equal to some other value, just a random uh, specific point that's defined. Well, if the function value and the limit value are not equal, again, I'm going to have to pick up my pencil. As I draw this picture, it's not continuous. Um, <clears throat> to kind of go back over here, um, this has a limit at c, though it doesn't exist. This function, we will be formally introducing infinite limits here very soon. The function is approaching positive infinity from both the left and right of c. So this function would um, very, very most likely have an, uh, a, uh, an infinite limit, or the limit as x approaches c of f of x is positive infinity. Whereas this vertical asymptote, the graph approaches positive infinity as it approaches c from the left, and negative infinity as it approaches c from the right. Thus, this has, again, no limit, not even an infinite limit. OK, <clears throat> at least not a two-sided limit. Well, um, I'm going to define on the next screen anyway, but these holes are going to be defined as removable discontinuities in the asymptote where there's a sharp break and you just can't fix that. Those are going to be called non-removable discontinuities. Let's get to those definitions. This page is just, uh, just some definitions that if you need in your notes, maybe you want to pause the video and write them down, but I'll just run through these relatively quickly. The two types of discontinuity are removable and non-removable. A removable discontinuity is f can be made continuous by appropriately defining or redefining f of c. Basically, it's just saying, hey, there's a hole here, and I, if I just make a special um, addition to my function, kind of make it a piecewise function, if you will, and say, okay, well, maybe my limit as uh, x approaches c of f of x, maybe my limit is 5. So, but it doesn't, the function itself doesn't exist there, so let's just add a special case, an extra additional line on my function that says f of c is equal to, I think I said 5 there, right? That the, I'm going to define the function to equal the limit as x approaches c of the function, and then fill in the hole and make the function continuous. A non-removable discontinuity is that clear break where it's not just a simple hole, and the real limit to the left and right of c are not equal. So that kind of brings me over to the left-hand side of my screen, or my board here, that the function of the, uh, the limit as the, of the function as x approaches c from the left and right are not equal. Now, those, um, then you can't, you can't just like fill in a little hole and go, oh, I can now draw this without picking up my pencil. The one-sided limits and continuity on a closed interval. Now, we're going to show how it makes or checks for continuity in a closed interval on the next screen, but let's make sure that we first understand left and right limits and how they um, define uh, whether a real limit exists. And I have been stressing the difference between a real and an infinite limit because uh, coming out of a pre-calculus book, you might believe that just uh, that the only type of limits there are are real limits, that the function is approaching uh, a real value from both the left and the right. But there is such a thing as an infinite limit where it, um, in very you know, layman's terms, approaches uh, either positive infinity or approaches negative infinity from both sides of uh, your value of c. So, <clears throat> the limit from the right, the limit as x approaches c from the right of f of x is some capital L, again, a, a real y value, if you will, or just a real value. Um, the limit from, they'll usually be y values, the limit from the left as x approaches c from the left, then f of x, and you know, if we're plugging in x's, we're getting y values, is equal to capital L. And the left and right hand limit are the same L, the same capital L, the same real value. So then, if they're equal, the existence of a real limit 
let f be a function and let c and l be real numbers. If the left and right limit are equal, then the limit as x approaches c of f of x is equal to l. What's the difference here? Uh, from the right, from the left, no little exponent, no, no signage on the upper right hand corner of the c. And that means that we're talking about a two-sided limit. Let's see how those one-sided limits allow us to check for continuity on a closed interval. A little bit more explanation before we get to those five examples. Definition of continuity on a closed interval. A function f is continuous on the closed interval a, b, if it is continuous on the open interval and, uh, you know, can't forget that interval notation you started using in pre-calculus, hopefully. Here we're not including a and b in the interval, and here we are. It's kind of like, uh, you know, the difference between greater than and greater than and equal to. The limit as x approaches a from the right of f of x equals f of a. That means you're continuous from the right going towards the left side of your closed interval. And the limit as x approaches b from the left of f of x equals f of b. So basically, what does that mean? That looks, sounds really complicated, but uh, if we have a function which is continuous on the open interval, and the only difference here is between being continuous on an open and closed interval is I have to make sure that the function's value is the same as the limit value. Uh, like say, if this is an open dot and this is a closed dot down here, the function has taken on a different value at b uh, different value from the limit as x approaches b from the left. Well, that's not going to be continuous on the closed interval, but again, if at the end of each, uh, the left and right side of the interval, if the function's value is the same as the value of the limit, then we can say that it's continuous on the closed interval as well as the open one. Properties of continuity. If b is a real number and f and g are continuous at c, then the following functions are also continuous at c. Uh, scalar multiple, like do you have a function that is continuous at c? Then simply multiplying it by 2 will give you another function, a scalar multiple of that function, that will as well be continuous at c. Sum and difference. If um, x is continuous at c, if um, the sine of x is continuous at c, then if I add and subtract those two functions, that final uh, difference function in that case will also be continuous at C. Product, same thing. If uh, this linear function is continuous at C, if this linear function is continuous at C, then when I multiply them together, I'm going to get another product function which is continuous at C. And the same thing holds true for quotients. Just make sure though that um, as you check for continuity your quotient, of course, um, you can't be dividing by C. So G of um, the function g or your denominator cannot be zero, of course, at this value of c. That wouldn't even be part of the domain, right? Okay, so the following functions are continuous at all points in their domain. Polynomials, think like lines and parabolas and cubic functions. Uh, rational functions, again, you can't divide by zero, but everywhere else or, yeah, everywhere else or all values that are in the domain uh, of that rational function, that rational function will be continuous along that entire domain. Radicals and trig functions as well. If you're in these functions domain, then those functions are going to be continuous uh, along all those values. So you don't, you know, you can checking is very simple. It is. Now, <clears throat> what does that really mean? That really means that when I give you a function and say, you know, uh, either check for continuity at a particular point or find values at which the function is uh, discontinuous, uh, much of your work is just going to be focused on finding values uh, where that function is undefined or in piecewise functions, uh, testing where the breaks are between those parts or pieces of your piecewise function. And that's what you're going to see now that we're finally getting to our five examples. So I have six examples instead of uh, five miscounted. Now, if you don't have any problems finding limits, then you can skip these two examples. If, uh, but you can't test for continuity if you aren't exactly sure how to test or find, excuse me, a limit. So I want to find the limit as x approaches 4 from the uh, right. And um, I'm going to do it on this uh, rational function. But this rational function is undefined at 4. If I take 4 and plug it in, I'm going to get 4 minus 4 is equal to 0. 
So if you didn't pick it up on your previous sections of finding limits um, analytically, or basically, you know, with the algebra technique, then uh, let's remind you. We have a, I need to try and manipulate this function somehow so that um, I can basically uh, come up with another function that will agree with this function everywhere except for at this value of C or, or 4, because this function is undefined at 4. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply the numerator and denominator by the square root of x plus 2. And we are going to get the limit as x approaches 4 from the right. Square root of x times square root of x is x. The square root of x times positive 2 is positive 2 square root of x. Now we have negative 2 square root of x. And then finally negative 2 times positive 2 is negative 4. That is going to be over. Now, I'm not going to multiply the denominators together because I want that factor to cancel out so I don't divide by 0. x minus 4 times square root of x plus 2. Well, what's going to happen? Um, thankfully, some nice stuff has happened. We can uh, do 2 square root of x minus 2 square root of x is equal to 0. So now my numerator is going to be x minus 4. And I hope you're trying to scream through the camera, stop, you already, you have that cancellation, because that's exactly what's going to happen, but I'm just showing all my work for your understanding. And if I do make a careless mistake somewhere, and do, you know, 4 plus 4 is equal to 9, uh, then I can actually find that answer somewhere within my work and either learn from it or easily fix it and redo the rest of my problem. That common factor on the numerator and denominator are going to cancel out. And so x, x minus 4 divided by x minus 4 is equal to 1. I still have that 1 in the numerator. And now I have another function that agrees with the original function everywhere except for the value of 4. We're going to plug it in and find the limit. So that is equal to 1 over the square root of 4 plus 2. That's going to be equal to 1 over 2 plus 2, which is equal to 1 fourth. So the limit as x approaches 4 from the right of this original function is equal to 1 fourth. If this uh, rationalization of the numerator had not created another function with, in which I could directly substitute in the value 4, then I would have just been forced to go back here and find the limit uh, numerically or graphically and see uh, what the function is approaching, um, the limit's approaching as the x is approaching 4 from the right. Over here we have the limit as x approaches 3. There's no uh, signage in the exponent area of the 3, so we're talking about a two-sided limit here. I want to know if there's actually a real limit um, for this function at 3. We have 3 plus, um, this is a greater integer function of x, and the greater integer function uh, says that I want the, the answer or the value I get from this, uh, this uh, term is the greatest integer n, which is less than or equal to x. So <clears throat> if I want to draw a graph of this, and I say let x equal like 0.2, well, 0.2, um, I'm plugging in 0.2, but I have to get out an integer, and it must be less than or equal to x. So if I plug in 0.2, I'm going to get out a value of 0. So for x values of 0 up until I get to 1, this is going to be equal to 0, and 3 plus 0 is equal to 3. So we got a closed dot. We're going to go and have an open dot where we have, so I can go up to like point no, 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 which um, if I'm plugging in point nine, 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 and I'm supposed to get on an integer that's less than or equal to x, that's going to come down to 0. But if I get to 1 and I plug in 1, I'm going to get out an n value of 1 because it's equal to x. So when I get to 1, I'm going to have a closed dot up here, go until an open dot at um, 2, and again step up 1 to, uh, when I plug in 3, or 2, excuse me, um, put in a 2, get out of 2, 3 plus 2 is equal to 5. Plug in 2.1, get out 2, 3 plus 2 is still equal to 5. We go to an open dot at the 3, and as soon as I plug in the exact value of 3, I'm going to step up to 6. So we can see by the graph that um, as I find the limit, as x approaches 3 from the left of 3 plus the greater integer of x, 
then that is going to be equal to, I'm approaching 3 from the left, I'm approaching 3 from the left, and that is going to give me a left limit equal to 5. And the limit as x approaches 3 from the right of 3 plus greater integer function of x, approaching 3 from the right, approaching 3 from the right, that's supposed to be between 3 and 4. As I approach from the right, my, le my right hand limit is equal to 6. My left and right hand limits are not equal, thus the limit as x approaches 3 of 3 plus, eh, I could have just wrote f of x here, does not exist. Now, <clears throat> again, we need to start, uh, you know, using this idea like, you know, here, if the limit doesn't exist, then I know that this function is not continuous at the value of, at the x value of 3. Uh, and that's why I'm reviewing you with you how to find limits before we get on to our foot next four examples. Uh, where we do check for continuity or look for places where the function is discontinuous. Discuss the continuity of the function uh, f of x on the closed interval. We have f of x is equal to 2 over square root of x minus 9, and we're looking for the continuity on the closed interval of negative 2, 3. So let's first just see if we can check um, what's going on, on the left side or the lower side of our closed interval. Well, the limit as x approaches negative 2, now it's the left side, so it's going to be approaching from the right, of 2 over x squared minus 9, that is going to be equal to 2 over negative 2 squared minus 9, which is going to be 2 over 4 minus 9, or um, 2 over negative 5. Now, <clears throat> as long as the um, limit of the function is equal to the function's actual value on that, uh, on this case, the lower side of our closed interval, then it's going to be continuous at least at the very end. So we have f, or the left side, f of um, negative 2. Well, I was able to do direct substitution with this function to get the limit. So I know that f of negative 2 is the same value, so that's going to be negative 2 fifths as well. Now let's check for the limit on the right. The limit, well, let's put this over here. The um, limit as x approaches 3, now this is the right side or the upper um, limit of our closed interval, so we're going to be approaching it from the left, of 2 over x squared minus 9. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a problem here because 2 over um, 3 squared minus 9 is going to be 2 over um, 9 minus 9, which is equal to 2 over 0, which means it doesn't exist. Well, in the previous example, I was able to finagle the um, function by rationalizing the um, numerator to come up with another function that would agree, and, and I was able to just take that value and plug it in and get the uh, limit. Well, here, I can't do any fancy tricks. I can factor this to be x plus 3 times x minus 3, but there's no mathematical, there's no algebraic steps that I can do to manipulate this into another function that would allow me to plug in the um, value of 3. So the limit does not exist on the upper uh, limit, or the upper uh, range of our closed interval, so this is not going to be um, continuous on the closed interval. Now, let me just um, sort of, I, I did this analytically with some numbers, but you could also remember, this is a rational function. I said rational func functions are continuous uh, for all values within their domain. Well, I kind of hinted that over here. If I take my original function and say f of x is equal to 2 over um, x plus 3 times x um, minus 3, then the domain of this function is all my x's going from uh, negative infinity to negative 3, and then picking back up between 3, negative 3, and positive 3, and then after I have to skip here, see these zeros in the denominator are, have nothing to cancel with the numerator, so they're going to be vertical asymptotes, and so I have to skip over that 3, and then my domain goes from 3 to infinity, and 3 
was part of my closed interval, so I kind of knew this was going to fail uh, the continuity test before I even started. And by the way, the function basically looks like this. We have an x-y axis, and if you're allowed to play with your graphing calculators, which there's a very good chance your teacher is not allowing you to use your graphing calculator because it can kind of do all the work for you and thus allow you to answer the question without really understanding what's going on. The function looks like this. And here we say that x value of 3, the upper limit of our closed interval, and the function clearly is undefined at that value. Woo! Next example! Almost next example, I just wanted to clarify something here. While we failed the test for this being continuous on the closed interval, it would be continuous on the open interval from negative 2 to 3, because uh, it's just going to be continually going down to negative infinity. And as long as I don't have to have it continuous at the value of 3, that's just one of the two places where this uh, uh, function has a restriction on the domain, that would be continuous on the open interval. But again, it did fail the closed interval. Test for continuity. Find the values of x, if any exist, at which f is not continuous. Okay, well, I have a rational function. Like I said, most functions, rational functions, are going to be continuous everywhere where it is defined, or everywhere uh, for all values in its domain. So I just got to find out what the limits are of this domain. I've been asking that question since uh, Algebra 1, I think. Uh, at any rate, we're going to factor the denominator, if it can be factored. Otherwise, I'm going to solve the denominator by using, say, like the quadratic formula. But uh, this is going to be equal to x minus 1. And factoring trinomials are very simple as long as the leading coefficient is equal to 1. It's a little bit more if it's not. We just have to say, are there factors of the constant that either add or subtract to the middle term? And for negative 3, it's going to be positive 3 and negative 1. So x minus 1 and x plus 3. Now. The, f, the factor of x minus 1 is going to create a restriction in the domain of x equals 1, and then we have x is equal to negative 3. And actually, for domain, this isn't really what x equals, but what x cannot equal. There is a hole in the graph at x equals 1, and there is a vertical asymptote at negative 3. And the function looks something like this. Um, there is a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, and it looks like something like this. So you can kind of see the importance uh, of what you learned in Algebra 2 or Precalculus about graphing rational functions and finding those holes in vertical asymptotes. This function is continuous everywhere except for 1 and negative 3. Uh, now, at the whole, that's a removable discontinuity. So there's a removable discontinuity at x equals 1, and there is a non-removable discontinuity at x equals negative 3. Over here, piecewise functions, again, generally give us the most amount of work in finding um, places, possible places, where it's discontinuous. This is just a constant function that's continuous in all uh, values of its domain, or actually all real numbers. This is a polynomial. That's continuous everywhere. This is another polynomial. So all three of these functions together, or individually, excuse me, are constant along the entire, you know, along all real numbers, negative infinity to positive infinity. So really all we have to do is check to see if it connects at these values of negative 1 and positive 1. These are very easy to graph, so the best way to do this, or the easiest way to do this, is simply draw yourself a picture. You don't need a graphing calculator for this. We have a basically a function of y equals negative 2. That's a horizontal line going through the y value of negative 2. And we're going to negative 1. So there's y equals negative 2, and this is just simply less than negative 1. So we're going to put an open dot there, which we may or may not fill up. If we can't fill it up, we found a discontinuity there at negative 1. We have 3x plus 1. Well, y equals 3x plus 1. That's a line with a slope of 3 and a y-intercept of 1. So if I come up here to uh, y equals 1, I can say, well, there's my y-intercept, and the slope is 3 over 1. So up 3 over 1. I can also do down 3, 1, 2, 3 over 1. Oh, look at there. I'm filling in the hole. So 
This is, goes from, and it, well, actually, I was a little premature there. That's x is greater than or equal to negative 1. If it was just greater than negative 1, I would still have an open dot, but it's equal to. So I'm going to fill up that space, and I'm going to where x is equal to 1, and it's just x is less than 1, so open dot. It's about as straight as I can get it. And now this is y equals x squared, a parabola. So let's see here, 0 squared is 0. So there's a point there, but I don't really want to include that. Uh, I want, I'm really concerned about what's the graph doing or starting to do at the x value of 1. Well, 1 squared is 1. So um, we got 1, 1 from plug in 1 and do 1 squared is 1. It's x is greater than or equal to 1, so that's a closed dot. And it's going to look something like this. So I can just see by drawing it that the left limit, the limit of the function as x approaches negative 1 from the left and approaches negative 1 from the right, they're both the same. The limit, the left and right limit are both equal to 3, so that's the two-sided limit uh, where x approaches negative 1 is equal to 3. So this function is continuous at negative 1, but as I get to positive 1, I'm approaching um, 1 from the left and my limit, 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, seems to be approaching 4, and <clears throat> I can simply plug in, you know, this is, a, this is just a line, I can find the limit using direct substitution. I'll write this up here in a second. It's approaching 1, 2, 3, 4, and from the right it's approaching a y value of 1. So I can visually look at this and see that the, that the function is going to be discontinuous at 1 because the left and right limits are not equal, thus the limit at 1 does not exist, and that fails one of the continuity tests. I'm going to pause and just sort of show you the algebraic uh, work to find that left and right limit as well. Last example, finally. Find the constant a that makes the function continuous. And in this case, it's going to be continuous at 0. So we have f of x is equal to 2, time, uh, two times sine x over x. And to a, and that's what the question is about, is trying to figure out this value of a to make this function continuous at this uh, value of 0 that the piecewise function is changing gears between these two functions minus 5x. So, let's start with the part of the function where I'm not actually trying to find out what a is equal to. So I have something to set this, you know, equal to and solve for a. So let's find the limit as x approaches 0. Now this is for when x is less than 0, so we're approaching from the left. So we're going to find the limit as x approaches 0 from the left. Okay, and we're going to be doing that for the first part of this um, piecewise function, so I'm just going to write 2 sine x over x. Now, <clears throat> to really make this a little bit clearer as to how I'm coming up with the answer, I'm going to actually rewrite this a little bit and remind you that this is 2, and let's put a coefficient of 1 in front of the x and rewrite it as 2 times sine x over x. Because hopefully remember that um, you know, the sine x over x, when I try and, you know, put in zero, of course, I'm, I'm, attempt, I'm, uh, I'm uh, dividing by zero. So we had, a, you know, we talked about a special case of finding the uh, limit as x approaches zero of sine x over x. You should have had that in your, one of your previous lessons or videos that I talked about in uh, finding limits of trig functions. So that's going to be 2 times 1, which is equal to 2. So the left limit, the left side limit uh, at 0 is equal to 2. So now let's set up the right side limit and make sure that it does equal 2. So the limit, I'm going to bring this up here, the limit as uh, x approaches 0 from the right of, okay, well now I know it's, it's of f of x, but as I approach from the right, that means I'm using x values that are greater than 0, so I'm using the second part of my piecewise function. That is uh, of 2a minus 5x. Now, I'm not just trying to find the right-handed or the right-side limit, excuse me, but I want to make sure that this function is continuous, and that starts off with making sure that the limit exists, and then you make sure that the function is the same value um, uh, as the limit, and then it's going to be continuous. So, <clears throat> and I'm using direct substitution, so if I find the limit, I know the function at that value is going to be the same. I want that right-hand limit to make sure that it's equal to 2. So the left and the right-hand limits are equal, thus the two-sided limit is equal, and I'm using direct substitution, so I know the function is going to be the same value at that, uh, 
or have the same value at that value of zero, or C as your note set. So <clears throat> that's what the right hand limit needs to be. Now I'm letting zero, X approach zero. So there's two variables in here, but I'm finding the limit as X approaches zero from the right. So X is approaching zero, and I'm going to do that substitution and say the 2A minus 5 times zero is equal to 2. Well, then that's just zero, and we get 2A is equal to 2. Divide by 2, and that means that A is equal to 1. So if A is equal to 1, that is going to be the value that's going to allow this function, this piecewise function, to be continuous at the value of 0 because our two-sided limit and the function of f of x at 0, they're going to be the same. Thus, the function is continuous, and I am done. So thank you for watching. I know there's a lot in this video, but hopefully now you have a complete understanding of continuity on open and closed intervals, one-sided limits, yada, yada, yada. I'm Mr. True. Bye. Go do your homework.